Welcome to a special edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 558. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 16th of December, 2019. So welcome to a special edition. I'm going to have an interview here with Gavin Ashington to announce some news. Before I do that, uh, this is probably going to be the most watched unscripted uh, this year or last year for the the, the next five years. So I really need you to share this. Let people uh, watch this throughout the the Anglican world and the, the Christian world. And you do that by copying that little hyperlink at the top and you send it out as an email. You send it to your friends and enemies because you're called to love your enemies in scripture. Please, if you get a chance and you've not subscribed yet, click that red rectangle on YouTube. That's the one there at the bottom of the screen right there. And a little bell will come up, click the bell, and you will be instantly subscribed to get notifications anytime there's a new Anglican Unscripted. And we appreciate that. This show will continue in the comments. If you have any comments or thoughts or ideas or prayers that come to you during this episode, leave them in the comments. Uh, Any feelings, pains, hurts, loves, whatever, we're there for you. We'd love to read the comments, respond to the comments. They're part of the ongoing show. Uh, Gavin and I first met uh, GAFCON 2 in the press room uh, in uh, Kenya, uh, Nairobi, Kenya and took an instant liking uh, to each other. Somebody used the word winsome before. You are the most winsome Englishman I've ever met. You have a a wonderful, wise voice. And I knew talking to you after five minutes that you get it. It's it's very difficult sometimes to have people who've come up in the institution of a church or denomination that really understand all the dynamics inside and outside of the Christian walk and I, I knew that you got it I know George gets it so many of the people we interview here in the sh- on the show get it they're what I call true believers and as such I've uh, enjoyed watching your walk when you when you first came on the show here you were uh, a chaplain to the Queen awesome <laughs> that's good uh, clearly he's doing the right thing he's he's walking and uh, he's helping serve uh, royalty in England and I'm like that's that's cool and then uh, uh, we found out you're a bishop which is awesome you uh, then uh, uh, decided that uh, you needed to separate yourself from the uh, Church of England and you cut yourself off and I don't know if there's an official thing other than sending a letter but you left the Church of England. How did that happen? Oh, well, there are two ways of doing it. I mean, you can't really leave the Church of England. There's no mechanism. But if you renounce your orders, okay. uh, which I did because I, I had a conversation with a bishop when I said, I'm going to join another Anglican denomination. They've, they've, they've invited me to be consecrated as a bishop. Can we do this nicely? <laughs> uh, the bishop I was talking to said, we may well come after you. Uh, we don't like what you're doing. And, and we've changed the rules so that it used to be that whilst you didn't have a post, you couldn't be brought up on a disciplinary charge. In order to catch paedophiles, quite rightly, they've changed the rules so that if you were ever ordained, you remain subject to canon law. And if, for example, you do a liturgy that's not, uh, not legitimate under canon law, we can come after you for anything. And, and you need to be careful because we may. And uh, I thought, well, if that, that's not doing things nicely, and I'm going to cause some trouble. So I, I, there was a very quaint mechanism set up in the 19th century, whereby Anglican priests who were persecuted by their bishops, mainly for becoming Methodists, uh, could resign their orders and move beyond the reach of canon law. And you pay ten pounds, and you take a little affidavit to the Royal Court of Justice. In my case, the woman behind the grill was a, was wearing a hijab. I thought that's about typical. <laughs> and uh, and you, they, they they then check up to make sure you're not hiding. You're not, there's then six month window where they check up to make sure you're not a fugitive from some misdemeanor. And after that, you're out of the reach of the Church of England and canon law. So I did that. Uh, I'd seen a number of clergy being chased by by the system illegitimately, and I. Uh, and that that gave me a sense that 
very sadly, very sadly indeed, I had to put some some space between myself and the church of my childhood I was baptized into. I had become very fond of. It's quite painful. Yeah, indeed. I left the Episcopal Church, and it it, it is a very painful uh, procedure. We actually uh, uh, had a uh, old Irish wake as we left. You know, just uh, uh, yes. you know the wailing and and separation. Uh, then you found yourself obviously uh, one or two years here on Anglican Scripted, and people saw in you uh, a lot of wisdom, knowledge, and great teaching, and you spent uh, a great deal of time traveling uh, to different conferences, giving teachings, uh, doing consulting, uh, and meeting with people around the world, and that's kind of been part of your focus for the last three years. But the, the, the way this the way this goes back to 2012 when mm -hmm. I was on General Synod where I'd been for, for, for 20 years and we we made some arrangements for the consecration of women bishops uh, because I spent some time in the previous 20 years as, as an ethical progressive I knew how much ethical Anglican progressives hated traditionalists <laughs> they really really do hate them and I knew that unless there was a watertight agreement uh, that those who, who, who found they couldn't accept the, the consecration of women as bishops would ultimately get squeezed out by, by their, their very determined opponents. And the watertight arrangements didn't happen. My, my colleagues settled for something less than watertight. And, uh, and, and to your credit, you, you were right because uh, it's December 2019. I can't think of any conservative Orthodox bishops in the Church of England. Am I right? Yeah, no, I was right, um, and, I, and I'm going to be even writer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it, <laughs> um, and so one of the things, I, I wrote a letter saying, if we're going to preserve some kind of, uh, of, of Catholic orthodoxy in the Church of England, we're going to, when we haven't been given a third province, at some point we're going to have to consecrate our own bishops, because they will, because without bishops you can't do anything as an Anglican. This, this letter went, 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 went places, and I got an invitation from some some really rather lovely uh, bishops in the Christian Episcopal Church in the States who said, we've been praying for England for a very long time, and we know there's going to be a need for an Orthodox Episcopal provision. And we'd, we'd like, and because our orders are Catholic, they, they come from a, uh, from a, a, a Roman Catholic bishop in Brazil in 1946, and we think that will be important when it comes to building bridges also later on. We'd like to ask you to take Episcopal responsibility and help and help uh, provide a framework for Anglicans who can't survive within the Church of England. And I said, I'm not going to do this. I'll look an idiot. And everyone will think that I did this because, you know, I haven't got a proper job in the Church of England. Um, it's true I've been blocked for a number of proper jobs, but uh, not proper, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've been, I, I, I'd, been, I'd been blocked for a number of senior positions. And... Uh, and that was why that was why dear Rowan Williams phoned the palace and said, "For goodness sake, give Gavin something." Uh, so, so um, uh, I didn't want to do this, but but the response was, "Well, you know, we we're all agreed on what's going to happen. Why are you refusing to be part of the solution? Is it pride?" Uh, and it was pride. So, so I that's why I accepted ordination and people consecration as a bishop. And people, of course, thought and said. A variety of things and that that that's fine um, it was for Jesus and for the kingdom and for the church not for me and the Lord's been very I'm sorry about this we've hit seven o'clock <laughs> that's going to be quite well, exciting with there's the not going to be extra <laughs> ticks and talks <laughs> that's not for whom, for whom the bell tolls it, it, well it that's tolls why you, that's the magic of Anglican unscripted you know you you do know every hour there's gonna be a lot of noise and we, we do appreciate uh, <laughs> the Ashington household but now we've you're a bishop you are um You've left the uh, Church of England. Where do you serve now? So one in, of the things I've, I've been, one of the things I've been doing is doing what I, I thought the Lord wanted. I believed, and I do. He did want me to do was to, to to try and prepare the ground for drawing together Orthodox Anglicans outside the Church of England. Now we we saw what happened in America when you did this. Mm -hmm. So you you went through exactly the same narrative of a of a, of a mother church that gave herself to the secular culture of the day and abandoned core 
Christian values to the point where it's almost not the Christian church anymore. And uh, and you had all these splits too, lots of split of Anglicans running off saying, well, you know, this is how we're going to do it. And, and amazing, you had two factors that were really very important. One was Elizabeth Jefferson Shorey and the other was Bob Duncan. Catherine Jefferson Shorey, yeah. Catherine, sorry, Catherine. That's right, that's right. So, so your presiding bishop was was so mean and so awful that she exemplified very clearly to people what the struggle really was. And Bob Duncan was so well trusted and so well loved that as he drew people together against their better wishes, when I mean, he didn't draw everyone together, there's still quite a lot of continuing Anglican churches out there in the states. Uh, but nonetheless, you managed to to to, to create ACNA, and that was what we needed to do in England. Um, and I've been working hard at something like that for the last uh, few years. The, the difficulty was that, and I said to a number of people, um, and um, uh, I think one of the key players I most admire is John Fenwick, um, whom I won't have anything said against because he's been her he's been heroic. Uh, in, in sharing this struggle, but well, let, let, let some people who are watching this don't know who John Fenwick is. He's the leader of the Free Church of England. It's a small Anglican church that's mm. been here for 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 a hundred years or more, mm. and 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 uh, John did his very best, and I I stood beside him to to begin the process of drawing the Anglican Orthodox groups together. Now we failed, and we failed very badly. And in fact, we've, we've failed so spectacularly that uh, although I believe in miracles and, and I look to the Lord to do them, at the same time, we have to exercise an informed judgment. And uh, and uh, I'd, I'd come to terms with that failure. There's not, I've been speaking to as many people as I could, both in this country and in America and in Australia. Uh, and, and I've been saying, look, you know, this is it's we know how to do this. We just need to walk humbly, speak well of each other, set aside tribal and partisan theological interests, put the kingdom and the church before our own understandings, uh, and and put our backs to to, to building a, an ecclesial refuge that will evangelize in this country. They did it in America and they did it well. Um, we can do it here, but but we haven't been able to do it. And in my judgment, we're not going to be able to do it. We, you know, I've been wittering on about repentance three years and 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 that was what was and is needed now there's no sign of it and um and that's so meanwhile the lord has blessed me greatly he has given me opportunity after opportunity to speak for the faith in the public media in extraordinary ways i mean really quite extraordinary uh and i've taken them and i've used them as, as well as i can now, during so, so I'm I'm happy to go on doing what I'm doing because you know I I, I I'm blessed. <laughs> well, uh, and and you never know when they're going to run out, but but so far they haven't run out. You've been a, a wonderful uh, co-host here on uh, on Scripted. You are, as far as I can tell, the default voice, uh, uh, Bishop's voice for the uh, BBC and uh, much of the media in uh, Britain. They call upon you whenever they need a good quote, and you often appear in video form. And I know you've been on because I see an increased viewership for Unscripted shortly after you've uh, uh, made an appearance on the media in the UK. But I got this phone call from you, and I wasn't able to take it, but you left a message. And it was right before I went for, uh, on vacation. And it was a message that I'm taking. I said, well, how are we going to make this work? Well, I don't have to worry about that. God does. But you said, Kevin, um, there's an opportunity that was given to me, uh, and I'm going to take it, and this is what it is. And uh, George got the, a message you left for both of us, and he goes, how are we going to work? make it work? He goes, forget what I said. God will make it work. So let's talk about what the decision is you made and uh, uh, how you came to that decision. So we're looking all the time for, for what Jesus wants. Um, it's not about what we want, and, and uh, it's about trying to discern what the Holy Spirit is calling us to. Every, everything we do is, is, is a vocation. But I've been, uh, over the last 20 years, I've been reading the Fathers uh, uh, more assiduously. 
essentially, I'm following in the steps of Newman, and I'm sorry if that sounds a bit pretentious. I'm a kind of, I'm, a, I'm, I'm. He he just charted the way, and I like him. I had a a, a great evangelical conversion as a youth. Like him, but not like him, a uh, much lower level. I became an academic, and I, 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 I taught in university. Like him, I'd been reading the fathers and had a vision for what Anglicanism could could be and should be. Like like him, I've fallen out with the establishment, and and um, and, and the relationship hasn't been very happy. I, I was invited to come and see the clergy in my local Roman Catholic cathedral, and they watch Anglican unscripted, <laughs> and they they read my stuff. And they said the bishop wants to talk to you because he needs you and we 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 talked about the situation in the catholic church and the church in this country and my local catholic bishop who is the one well there are two really orthodox catholic bishops in this country mark davis of shrewsbury and philip egan of portsmouth and they're very close friends uh and we sat down together he said i've been so glad to have a fellow catholic bishop around uh i i, I respect your orders and what you say but he said i need you where we are, I'm producing twice as many priests in my diocese as any other diocese in the country. Uh, and I'm going to, well, I'm not going to, I, I, I don't want to say what his plans are because they're his plans and they're, they're not the point. But basically he says, we need your help here. Uh, I know you're going to come across and become a Roman Catholic one day, uh, you know, maybe on your deathbed like Constantine or a bit earlier. But but would you would you please consider coming across earlier because we need you? Um, now the difficulty is that it's been quite hard to to get over the impression that in the kind of Anglican Orthodox subworld which I live in, uh, this is not about self pity, but 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 um, uh, that sense of being needed for the kingdom of God as we've been doing here is is not uppermost really in the in in the dynamics of the relationships we've been having. I, on the whole, I I I've been seen I think more as an irritant than than uh, a solution to needs but even if i've got that wrong it isn't really quite the point as i as i prayed about this i couldn't get rid of of a, a passage um uh, in the new testament where st paul has a dream from the Ma in which the macedonians appear and they says come over we need you and I, I there's this very strong link between these two events and i i said i'd pray about it and um one of the difficult things is that that, that although I have a number of clergy, two things happen. One is my fellow clergy said, who came to me for a license, you know, Gavin, one day we're going to become Roman Catholics. We see that as our ultimate destination. Hope that doesn't upset you too much. <laughs> but that's where that's where we're heading. Meanwhile, we need your license and your Episcopal cover. Um, and, and the other is that as people have written to me saying, well, we want to join your church. Where, where do we find your church locally? And I had to say, well, I've, I've got quite an internet church, but it's pretty thin on the ground. Uh, and so they said, well, where do we go for communion? Where do we go for fellowship? And and I'm building something to which there's no answer for that. So so I'm fine. But 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 in terms of an, of building the church on the ground, it's it's not fine. And I'm happy to be an Internet guru um, who gets invited on to the uh, the media from time to time. But, you know, we have to build the church. Uh, and so when the local Catholic community said, please come across and help us, we need you. And this is what we need you for. Please pray about it and come soon because times are urgent. And when at the same time, there is a level of congruity in our understanding of both the kingdom and the church and the task, because they have exactly the same problem as we have. Uh, I find it very difficult, apart from reasons of self-preservation, to say no. Now, I, I, I've, I've said yes, and I'm going to be received into the Catholic Church this coming Sunday, the fourth Sunday of Advent. And I will give up my, my orders. This is the last time I'll wear this shirt, this pectoral cross. Um, and I will start at the bottom as a lay theologian and then Rome will decide whether they have any use for me in orders and they might decide that I can be reordained as a Catholic priest. They might even decide, and this would be quite funny, that my orders are sufficiently Catholic to be recognized by the Catholic Church, in which case my dear Bishop Mark said, you know, Father, he said, you do realize if they recognize your episcopacy, there will still only be room for one bishop in this diocese, and it's me. <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go empty-handed, and I don't know what the outcome will be. But the thing is, looking over the next five or ten years, we have to build the church. And at the moment, 
I don't see that happening as uh, the, the allegiance, the alliance of Anglican Orthodox bodies. It's not going to happen there. We're, we're just going to build schism. Small school, small schismatic groups that don't speak very well of each other, if the present is any guide to go by. And, um, and I, I never stand up to build schism. I believe in the unity of the church and the spirit in, in the adoration of Jesus. Uh, and so if I can't do it as an Anglican, well, the, and I'm asked to do it as a Catholic, and I happen to believe Catholic things, I find it very difficult to say no. So I've said yes. And um, uh, <laughs> then I came to you and said, well, what are we going to do with unscripted? Because I won't be Anglican in that sense. I'll be Anglican in the sense of uh, Ecclesia Anglicana, an Englishman uh, in the church. Um, and this is one of the things, you know, I, don't, I, I, I have no idea where this happens. I will, I will lose quite a lot of support. I'll lose some friends. I'll lose some ministry. But but I think I'm, I'm absolutely certain, not I think, it's what the Lord wants at this stage. So despite the fact, again, I'm, you know, someone said, why can't you settle down to anything? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it, people recognize that, you know, there's Anglo-Catholics. You can be a Catholic Anglican. We will uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, endorse that line of thinking. As far as unscripted, uh, your role uh, hopefully won't change. Uh, your pay isn't going to change. You know, I have no pay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but but uh, uh, being a uh, uh, a theologian uh, on the shores of England who've served the church in so many ways, uh, we could not help but have your voice here on on scripted. Uh, as long as uh, God wills it, and we, we, we certainly look forward to that. Um, certainly the, the news is a shock to George and I, and um, we've uh, expressed that in, in many ways to Gavin, uh, but in the same way, uh, Gavin at the end of each day is uh, uh, trying to glorify God, as George does, as I do, as everyone on the program uh, does, and that's uh, uh, this is Gavin's journey towards that expression of uh, glorifying God. And there's no other way to put that. You know, Gavin is on his way to Rome in five days, and uh, uh, I have purple in my background, and he has purple in his shirt, and uh, you will not see the purple on his shirt next week <laughs> on the show. And, you know, it, it's important when we see transitions like this that we're not so much looking to condemn it as much as we're looking to see what God can do with it. And I've always had that in my mind. Everything is redeemable. And if God can use Gavin Ashington to reform the Roman Catholic Church, awesome! Because they deserve somebody like Gavin to do it. You know, you, uh, you've done nothing but glorify God in our program. Uh, we have comment after comment, email after email of how this program has helped bring people uh, back to their faith or for the first time bring them to faith. And I expect nothing else except that very mission when you are a Roman Catholic. And uh, uh, thank you for serving us and thank you for continuing to serve us. Uh, any parting words before uh, I, I click the uh, unrecord button, so to speak? <laughs> well, uh, pray for me because um, I feel like I've let go of one trapeze and I'm promised another trapeze flying through the darkness, but it hasn't appeared yet. Uh, well, that, that's, that's the life of faith. Uh, and I, I think just let's, let's pray for each other that we serve and renew Christ's church. Um, it's been broken so badly in the past by human sin and failure. And if there's anything we can do and offer our Lord, our contrition and our humility uh, and our love to mend the church, e even if we begin, as I was saying in the last show, by, by trying to choose to speak better of each other than than worse of each other, by, by keeping our eyes open for the good things that God has done, rather than concentrating on the rather lousy things that we've done. Uh, so no, I, th I think it's simply that, that um, 
I believe passionately theologically that the, the, the struggles of the Reformation in the 1520s are not our struggles today, but that we, we face a common enemy, a common cultural war, and we're given a common Christian solution. Uh, and in that sense, I hope the way in which we express our dominant denominational identities work towards the kingdom and towards collegiality instead of as they have in the past worked against it so so let's let's pray for each other and thank you for i mean you know thank you particularly thank you to you and, and george for being so patient and understanding and, and gracious i think our friendship together uh, i mean it's got nothing to do with our denominations i mean uh, it, it's, it's everything to do with our love of god and and our gratitude to his kindness to us um well, we, so we also let's celebrate that yeah, we need to make clear that you're, the, the grass is not greener over in the Roman <laughs> Catholic <at all>. Church. <laughs> I always say to myself at night, well, at least I'm not the, in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, where you're headed off to. Uh, it, it's going to be hard work. The yes, difference the grass is, is not greener. The difference is nobody that I've seen in GAFCON or the ACNA or uh, the Church of England or on the shores of England had say, Gavin, come work with us. The Roman Catholic Church says, we need you. And Gavin said, okay. And that's that's the difference I see. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm still Gavin Ashenden. And you've been kindly and patiently and prayerfully listening to episode 558 of, uh, of the unscripted of the Ecclesia Anglicana. <laughs> Thank you for your kindness on the 16th of December 2019.